Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased that you've, you're able to join us today. Um, we're here from Manchester. The background in my slide is of the university campus, which I'm really missing. I'm not allowed to be there. It's a false background. And the weather's not as nice in Manchester today as what it is in my photograph. Um, so today, as Greg has been saying, we, Jenna, um, Jenna O'Brien and myself, we both work at the University of Manchester. We're going to tell you a bit about what we've been doing in relation to the sustainable development goals more broadly. Um, and, and obviously this is the audience here is um, a public health audience. We will touch on that, but what we're going to do, you're, you're talking a lot today about SDG3 in particular. Um, we're going to talk more broadly about the Sustainable Development Goals and not just what our university does, but what the role of universities more broadly are in contributing to the Sustainable Development Goals because universities themselves as institutions throughout the world have a very important role in addressing the SDGs. Um, so we'll take you through that. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes and then Jen is going to come in, come in and then talk for another 10 or so. And then it probably makes sense, Greg, if we take questions together, Jen and I, after that. Yeah. So I'll take it away then and I'll share my screen. Just a moment. Share screen. PowerPoint share. Um, so can um, Greg, is that You've got the University of Manchester screen there. Is that okay? Yeah, that's it. yeah fantastic. Thank you. Um, so the first thing to say then is who I am. So I'm Julian Skirman. I'm the Director of Social Responsibility at the university. So I have a role that um, spans right across the institution and I oversee the university's strategy for how we address social responsibility. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Um, this is our campus, which you can see in my background. I wanted to sort of start with that to say that for um, many of the people around the world tuning in today, just to note the a bit, a little bit of information about the university where I work and where Greg, who's hosting this, works as well. So we are the biggest campus in the UK. So in terms of um, number of hectares, if you like, a number of buildings, we're the largest. Ourselves and UCL are the two largest institutions in the UK. So we're very large. We have around 40,000 students about 12,000 staff, and we're in contact with around half um, half a million alumni, around 500,000 alumni, so we're a really big community. Um, in terms of some other key facts about the university, we've been around a long time, nearly 200 years now, and um, we've got um, uh, some really interesting heritage, I think. We've got um, 25 Nobel Prize winners among current and former staff and students, so one famous one, perhaps the second person to get a Nobel Prize at Manchester was Rutherford for the work he did on splitting the atom, for example, right through to today, um, our physicists that isolated graphene in Manchester in 2010. Um, other things which um, Manchester is quite famous for, I guess, is inventing the computer that could store memory. That's a really important um, development that happened. Um, so some of the um some of the other things i thought it'd be worth you knowing as well is about um our goals within the university today so we have three core goals one is to do world-class research uh, so discovering um knowledge and sharing that knowledge the second goal is around providing outstanding learning and student experience um so those are the two traditional core functions of the university discovering new knowledge and passing that on. So discovering the new knowledge is the research and passing that knowledge on, um, whether that's to our students or more broadly to the public is around our, our learning. Unique in British higher education is we have this third goal of social responsibility, which um, Jen and I work towards, although Jen, um, as she'll explain to you as well, works on goal two as well. And what she's gonna talk about is the intersection of all three of these things actually, but um, Jen is very much involved in um, taking forward innovative forms of learning within the university as well. So there are three core goals. Um, in terms of where we stand, um, in terms of the, the quality of what we do, if you like, at Manchester. So um, we've, we've been a sort of a top 50 university for some time now. In, um, there's various rankings of universities. There's a couple there, one where we feature 27th, another we feature 33rd. In terms of our impact on social and environmental factors, though, we have featured first in the UK for the past two years, running in a new um ranking which has been produced by the Times Higher Education, which is based exactly on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, 
in terms of our heritage as well, we were the first of what people call the civic universities, um, institutions that developed royal charters outside of London, um, mostly in Victorian times. And that's really important, that civic uh, history of Manchester in terms of the type of institution we are today. So onto the sustainable development goals, I won't say what they are. You've heard a lot about this, and I'm sure everybody um, listening today knows quite a bit about the fact that there's these 17 goals and there's various um, indicators and targets, as you've heard in the last presentation. What I do want to say, though, from the perspective of a university, these are enormously important, and they're important for, for many reasons. This slide, I, I'm not an astronomer, but... Um, I think you can see when you look at this slide, there's something she's doing wrong and um, she's looking exactly through the wrong end of that telescope. And I think this is a good uh, metaphor for sometimes the way universities have thought about their relationship to society. Those of us, and I know there's many people on, on the, in this webinar today who work in universities, we're not always the best at aligning what we do, um, whether it's the language, the concepts, the way we think, the drivers, the funding, the reward system aligning those things to what the needs of society are. And there's been something perhaps, particularly with the rise of populism around the world, there's been something of a disconnect between experts of which universities are a part and their wider populations. And part of that is, I, I believe, that people don't perhaps understand um, as well as they should do what the purpose of a university is and what its benefits are to society. And some of that is our own fault, perhaps. I think some of this is the, the, the style of particular forms of politics, but also we can't just um, say there's no responsibility upon ourselves as universities. So universities have a, a, a very important responsibility in our view in Manchester to connect what they do to real world challenges and issues and problems that exist. And what better, what, what better framework to align ourselves to than the sustainable development goals, of course, because these are goals that are universal. So they don't apply just to the UK in my context, they apply to the whole world. They don't just apply to developing countries, they apply to the global north as well as the global south. They don't just apply to universities, they apply to the private sector, they apply to the public sector, and they apply to the, the third sector of which in the UK at least the universities are a part. Um, so they apply to all different sectors. They also apply to citizens as well. What can we do as individuals as well as to governments and to corporations? So there are an amazing framework within which you can think about the purpose and the impact of a university. So we've been doing a lot of thinking about how can we um, align ourselves to these goals and also use these goals as an opportunity to really tell a story and also to reorientate some of the um, activities within the university. So I was just going to say something very brief about that. So before I do this, I'm going to attempt to share a video with you now. I hope I'm, I'm not going beyond my technical competency. So I'm going to press stop share. Nothing is going wrong. Get my YouTube video on and, and click to, um, to, to share again. So just a moment, I'm going to try to do this. Very ambitious, I know. Right. Share screen. Share. Here we go. So you should now, and I'll just ask Greg, you should have a blank screen ready for me to press play. Is that what you've got, Greg? Yeah, that's correct. Fantastic. So I'm going to play you, this is um, interesting, isn't it? I'm going to play you a YouTube video within YouTube that you're watching. <laughs> so let's see if this works. In 2015, the world's nations developed 17 new priorities to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure prosperity for all. These are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. At the University of Manchester, we believe universities exist for public benefit and our commitment to social responsibility means that we're addressing these global goals through our research, learning, public engagement and operations. We are responsible for producing 4% of the UK's research on the Sustainable Development Goals and we provide an accessible learning environment for students to address these goals. We engage with the public and maximise social and environmental benefits through our operations. We're addressing inequalities in labour through our pioneering partnership, The Works. I just thought it would be one of those typical Kind of employment places you go there you have to tick all the right boxes and then you leave again if you get the job you get the job but it was nothing like that the works offers a one-stop employment service in our local community 
And through it, we've supported over 4,000 people from our local communities into work at the university and with local partners, generated over £60 million pounds of value each year. Tackling the world's biggest challenges requires global thinking. We're supporting gifted professionals from Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania and Ethiopia to address the Sustainable Development Goals through our master's programs. I was the recipient of the Alan Gilbert Scholarship and uh, through their generous support, um, I was able to do my one-year master's uh, urban planning program. The experience I got from Manchester was the diversity. That interaction with different students from different areas was enriching for me. Five years down the road, I'll be sharing my knowledge across the region and helping to build much more uh, sustainable cities. Over the past decade, 287 full scholarships have been awarded. These scholarships are fully funded by the university and the generosity of our donors. Demand for energy and irrigation services is growing and being met through 3,700 new dams around the world. Future Dams is an £8 million global research collaboration led by the university to improve the sustainable design, selection and operations of dams. At the University of Manchester, we've assessed our contribution to all 17 sustainable development goals in a pioneering new report. Our impact against these goals was ranked the best in Europe and third in the world by the Times Higher Education University Impact Rankings. Whether you're in the UK or overseas, the public or private sector, policy or education, a funder or an NGO, let's work together to tackle the world's sustainable development goals by 2030. Okay, um, Greg, am I back on screen now? I should be. Yeah, you are. Thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is pass over to Jen, just to say, um, by way of conclusion, what we've been doing at Manchester is um, we, we, we produced a report, and Greg can share a link to this um, as part of the proceedings. We produced a very comprehensive report into our impacts against the sustainable development goals. And as the video indicated, we were thinking about our impacts in four main ways for a university. So yes, we do research. So take um, all of the research and let, let's take the example of COVID-19. Why not, you know, a topical example. You could, <laughs> you could look at what um, our impacts were on COVID-19 as you can, um, which is a, obviously a communicable disease, which the SDGs, um, SDG3, um, looks at reducing communica communicable diseases. You can think about that issue in four different ways if you're a university. You can think about the research you do. So yes, we have virologists and immunologists who are doing research right now on COVID-19. So yes, we can produce new knowledge. Secondly, we can pass that knowledge on, and Jen's going to talk about that in a moment. We, we teach, so we are teaching people immunology, virology. We're teaching people about um, the relationship of air quality and how that changes during um, the, the current pandemic, for example. So we're teaching all these things in the university. The third thing is we're doing public engagement. We're reaching out to the public. So we, lots of our academics are doing things like we're doing today. Um, they're, they're speaking to the, to the media, for example, um, and have a very important role as public intellectuals. We have um, opened up our university museum online, um, uh, and that's a way which we can reach out to the, to the public with particular issues. So there's a public engagement function, thirdly. And then fourthly, um, we have operations. Universities in many cases around the world are often the biggest spenders, the biggest employers, the biggest economic actors in their areas. Um, and they have many um, privileges really as anchor institutions in their areas, as big employers and big spenders. So take um, the University of Manchester. It's um, the second biggest employer in the city of Manchester after the National Health Service. We're based right next to the hospital. So we have a car park in the university, for example, at the moment, which is totally empty. And we've given over access to that car park um, to, to visitors and NHS staff um, during the current pandemic because um, more and more people have been working in the hospital at any given time and they didn't have enough um, car parking space. 
I say that as an example of something a university can do through its operations. We exist as a big economic actor. What can universities do to take um, to make more use of the fact that they're such big employers? So you can look at different um, aspects of the sustainable development goals in those four different ways, our research, our teaching, our public engagement, and our very operations, um, how we exist and what we do to exist. So we did this report looking at all 17 SDGs using those four factors, and we'll send a link around to people to look at that. And we thought it was a really good way to think about our impacts and also then start to set ourselves some goals and targets ourselves within the university. And one of our goals very much was around how we orientate our learning experience more to students for, to prepare them for the type of world they will enter in where these are the main goals in the world. And that's a really good point now to hand over to my colleague, Jen, who's going to talk precisely about this. So I'll pause there. We'll take questions once Jen has finished, if that's okay, Greg, and we'll try and bring Jen in now. And I'll mute myself and Jen will unmute herself and magically we will transition from one part of Manchester where I am, Wally Range, over to another, which is called Levinsum in Manchester. So seamlessly we will move across. Hello, can you see me? We can, Jen, yeah. You can, thank you. Um, Thank you so much for welcoming me today. This is so exciting. I wish I knew how many corners of the world I have the, the honour of talking to you for, at the moment. Um, forgive me, I wanted to say hello if you'd have to see a face, but I'm going to switch the video off because my internet is having its own lunch break at the moment and is struggling ever so slightly. So forgive me for being a, um, a haunting voice that is talking at you um, for the next, the next few moments or so. Um, I work in an incredibly collaborative way, so please do feel free with any questions or thoughts you might have, either through the Twitter or directly to me after the presentation. So my name is Jen O'Brien. I am a senior lecturer in geography. I specialise in sustainable um, development, and I'm the director of social responsibility for the School of Environment, Education and Development. So I technically work uh, under Julian's leadership for the, the University of Manchester. And as Julian kindly outlined, the, there's a big picture of the role of the Sustainable Development Goals within the University of Manchester, which speaks very closely to our third goal of social responsibility. And what I'm going to do for the next couple of minutes is to try and narrow that down, narrow the focus in, and um, to explain a little bit about how I believe the Sustainable Development Goals can be used within teaching and learning to affect change. And this is where, as Julian outlined, the University of Manchester has done spectacularly well in the, the Times Higher Education rankings of SDGs. But I'm sure any educator or professional worth their weight in short dust and promotion applications would critique the role of, of metrics. But what I really like about these rankings, is, as Julian mentioned, is that they open up space for new partnerships, new opportunities to affect change. And I believe in the SDGs as a major lever for change. Um, but actually, as Cathy uh, alluded to in her earlier presentation, that's a huge challenge. It's often much easier said than done, and particularly in such a rapidly changing world that we live in um, at the moment. Some of these slides you've seen before, I quite like that we've all used the same image of the sustainable development goals. And I'm sure many uh, of the listeners are aware of the fact that the SDGs transitioned for the Millennium Development Goals. And there was this notable shift from a focus on poverty towards a focus on inequality. And that was quite a political move. Um, it required immense commitment from all nations involved at different scales, commitments around finance, about actually impacting change through the SDGs, and drew very, very importantly, on partnership. Now, I'm sure many people know about the triple bottom line of sustainability as outlined in the Brooklyn Report of 1987. We're used to seeing this idea of people, planet and profit coming together for sustainable development. But under the SDGs were added these two additional elements, peace and particularly partnership. And I find this truly fascinating. Partnership is a really interesting notion, concept, ideal, particularly in sustainable development. It's so easy to say, and yet decades of development thinking have critiqued the romanticism of notions of partnership, of, specific, of blah, 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 even participation, um, working with people on the ground, ensuring that no voice is left behind, that the needs of the most marginalized are heard, and preferably are leading the agenda in a most participatory and fair way. Um, really challenging to work across multiple scales, incorporating all of those voices. And above all else, partnership requires really good governance at every stage. And this is where, to me, this idea of partnership, which is seen as one of the quite discrete goals, 
is actually really essential and becomes almost like the bedrock, the foundation of achieving the uh, sustainable development goals. This becomes even more challenging if you think about the crazy different interlinkages across the sustainable development goals. And, and I'm going to uh, reference some of these, albeit um, transgenderly early when we're talking about the breadth of SDG3. You can look at SDGs in all sorts of different perspectives. These are just three that I picked up on that show different ways of viewing them. Uh, the one at the bottom from the Stockholm Resilience Centre uses food to frame the SDGs around the triple bottom line of sustainability. The goals are huge. The different measures, there's 169 targets within them. Again, as Amit said earlier, we still don't have a complete methodology to measure impact um, or kind of real achieving these targets. Perhaps that's where the role of data comes in and big data. Um, but it's really hard. Um, as Julian introduced earlier, the SDGs are supposed to be as applicable to Manchester as they are to Malawi. And this is where, to my mind, the notion of partnership is so, so very important. And particularly, uh, that partnership becomes more acute under COVID, which I guess is a natural discussion, a natural framework for our discussion today. And uh, please forgive me, I don't for a second mean to sound heartless about a pandemic that has led to hundreds of thousands of deaths globally and is immensely entrenched inequalities at every scale and will have lasting impacts for de decades to come. Um, but I am a great believer in learning from experiences and seizing every possible opportunity. And that can also go some way to reduce the sadness. I heard a wonderful quote recently, which attributed to Damien Barr, which says that when it comes to COVID, we're not all in the same boat, but we are in the same storm. And to weather that storm more than ever, we need to work together. So some of our colleagues at the University of Manchester, uh, uh, Dr. Rory Horn and Professor Hume, just published a recent paper that talks about the needs for institutions and norms to recognise that we all live in one world. And arguably, this is where COVID presents us with an opportunity to press the reset button on quite a few structural and institutional challenges, some of which we've already seen about... Um, oh, uh, expectations introduced around airline... Um, uh, funding, for example, and the expectations, the French government have just asked Air France to consider its uh, carbon emissions, for example. The UK government has invested a lot of money into walking, walking and, and cycling. We're seeing great things. Now, as Julian outlined, universities more than ever are being challenged to demonstrate their purpose um, and public benefit. So whether it's through climate crisis or the public health crisis of COVID, suddenly more than ever, we're thinking about the role of scientists, the role of policy makers. And I would argue that we are educating the professionals of the future. So the way that I see it, my students are a 40,000 strong force for change. And our students want to make change. So here for me is a new partnership, a partnership that I would like to develop. And let me explain to you a little bit, bit why. So I see the SDGs as a framework for effective pedagogy. So moving beyond metrics and measurements, actually utilizing the ethos, the spirit of SDGs in our teaching and learning. So the wheel up here speaks to the different ways in which our, uh, our courses, our learnings links up to the SDGs. Um, I promise to shamelessly promote the fantastic work of a colleague of mine, Dr. Roger, Roger Harrison, who's just launched a superb free course on antibiotics. Uh, uh, that unroll here link is a live link if anyone can access it. Um, it's a free open course and I don't need to tell most of the audience I'm sure that uh, antibiotic resistance is now on the WHO's top 10 list of major threats to, to human survival. Um, Julian identified a number of ways in which our teaching already speaks to the SDGs. There's a framework for pedagogy. The SDGs opens up opportunities. So I'm trying to really embed those principles and those practices. Um, so I use Education for Sustainable Development, or ESD, which is a framework for learning and operating. ESD is rapidly being recognised internationally as an integral element of quality education, and it's a key enabler for sustainable development. So taking an ESD approach, you can deliver, I would argue, quite a transformative education by reorientating learning in its broader sense to develop knowledge, skills, values and behaviours that are needed for sustainable development. And this is where we're encouraging individuals to become responsible actors who resolve challenge, respect cultural diversity and continue to contribute towards making a more sustainable world. 
So this is where I think some of the core premises, some of which have been outlined today across the different presentations of the sustainable development goals and particularly partnership, but also data, the premise of leaving nobody behind, these all become an incredible incredibly valuable learning opportunity, but also one that I would argue could propel sustainable development and that you can apply to any learning space. Now, forgive me, I'm, I'm quite enthusiastic about this. I could talk to you for hours, um, but let me give you just one example that we've been working on uh, this, this last year. So we've delivered a new course um, through our University College of Interdisciplinary Learning, which runs through the University of Manchester. It's, it's a unique centre uh, that offers courses to any students who have free choice credits. I really like that it's online and again embodying the principles of the SDG that means that it brings flexible learning to perhaps learners who are part-time they have caring commitments they need to work or just want to change in in, in their way uh, the way of learning it also means that our learning spaces are constructed by by medics by social anthropologists by mathematicians by engineers and together we can then construct new spaces of learning that cast a different lens, a different collaborative light on old problems. Now, for any of you who work in uh, British higher education, I'm sure you've heard of the old, you know, the classic 1990s adage as students as partners, but this is where genuinely working with students in a mutually respectful manner I didn't half learn. I learned so much from my students. We invited students to feedback at the end of each module to apply their knowledge, recognizing the diversity of their backgrounds and their interests. Students challenged me and there were times at which I had to change the course overnight. Bringing these voices together, over 80 voices from policy, practice and the academy, um, drawing across those multifaceted interlinkages of the SDGs that I referenced earlier, enabled these different viewpoints, these different insights. And of course, we drew upon the big hitters of the university, um, Professor David Hume that I referenced earlier, and Professor Kevin Anderson. But in endeavouring to capture the insight of more than just the white male professionals, no, no offence if you happen to be listening, uh, Professor David Hume, um, but we engaged voices from from the field, from across the global south, through NGOs, through CBOs. Uh, Rose Mary Nakwami, if you're listening, Rose runs um, Remy East Africa. She's one of our equity merit scholars. She contributed to our SDG3. Uh, Sarah Lager, who's also one of our SD, our, um, I'm sorry, equity merit colleagues, led the gender equality SDG5 module, and she's currently looking at PhD opportunities. Again, working together, different insights, different viewpoints. Um, enabled a different way of learning around the SDGs. And another element to that was utilizing applied real world research, which I'm just gonna to talk through to you very quickly for the next, next minute or two. So, so given the nature of the audience, it's natural here for me to draw on SDG3. Um, good health is often abbreviated too, but as we know, good health also encompasses um, well-being, which makes X SDG3 a truly massive goal. Amit talked earlier about how it covers everything from health systems through to MMR, IMR, it talks about Ebola and malaria through to non-communicable, more social science health issues such as smoking and traffic accidents. And I should absolutely acknowledge my appreciation of Dr. NM Hack from UOM's medical school who gallantly led our SG3 D3 module for the USIL course, uh, trying to navigate a way to bring together some coherent learning experience for the students in such, such a huge goal. Lost amongst it, lost amongst SDG3, is air quality, which I would argue before COVID-19 was set to be our next health epidemic. Now, an immediate partnership is illustrated here because this is how I first met Greg. Uh, right now, by rights, Greg and I should be equipping 100 students with air quality monitors um, through plume lags. And Greg, I promise that we will eventually, we will do that at some point. Um, but air quality is complex. Clean air is essential at multiple scales across the world, and particularly now that there are proven links between air pollution and vulnerability to coronavirus. So a 2018 report by King's University identified that reducing PM 2.5, so particular matter 2.5 and nitrogen dioxides by one third in Greater Manchester would add three and a half months onto every single person's life expectancy and save somewhere around 500 million pound per year. 
Now, the lockdown due to COVID has already reduced our nitrogen dioxide levels by more than half. So the images on the right hand side here, UK based to uh, looking across London from slightly different aspects before and after COVID. I'm drawing upon some local examples here, but equally, you could talk about the fact that suddenly the Himalayas are visible again from Delhi. Uh, we've seen massive air pollution reduction in China, uh, which is actually beginning to pick up again now lockdown has lifted. So the coronavirus lockdown has transformed human activities in urban data, and sorry, and our urban data can show how that has happened. And this is where drawing upon these new partnerships, linking together our research and our teaching, we've been able to identify this. So the University of Manchester's Urban Observatory uh, worked in partnership with Transport for Greater Manchester and Manchester City Council, who shared with us some of their data. Uh, this is traffic movements um, before and during lockdown excuse me, and we've been able to better understand the impacts that um, data can have to make us think differently about using space uh, and think about impacts that can be put into place. What I thought was really quite interesting is despite all this massive levels of, of big data, often, and again, as Kathy referenced before, some of the qualitative, more human, on the ground uh, community insights are also really important. So the, the image here is of a few bollards that have been put up at towards uh, as you approach a local school. This was fed into this big consultation, lots of uh, lots of you know, high end uh, traffic planners. Uh, and these were mums saying actually a really simple way to improve air quality around schools is just to stop cars uh, idling um, uh, outside. Excuse me. So what we begin to see is an illustration of how this very seemingly simple goal, SDG3, good health, actually speaks across a whole different host of the sustainable development goals with very much SDG 17, partnership for the goals in the middle. And these are some of the tensions that I'm trying to tease out uh, into our pedagogy, getting our students to think about the, the linkages across the goals and their insights or capabilities to enhance change by thinking across those linkages, working together in interdisciplinary partnerships, applying their different lenses and understandings. So we're bringing this together through this concept of university living lab for pedagogy. Um, the concept of living lab is now, is now a little bit older. Uh, it very much draws upon this, this premise that universities can be seen as sites of experiments. We can do more than just reduce our impact on the world, but we can actively contribute to it. It's now really quite critiqued. And one of my critiques is that pedagogy is missing from that. So what we're doing is engaging uh, deploying, if you like, our 40,000 strong for potential change in real world research to affect change. So we're equipping our geographers, for example, with our plume uh, air monitors. We'll do the same with Greg students as soon as we can after lockdown, because I do promise I owe you that one, Greg. Um, and we're utilizing these partnerships for data collection, for the analysis and the interpretation. And what I'm trying to do is to bring together this open resource platform, excuse me, that can share uh, needed research, interesting projects that will engage our students from an interdisciplinary viewpoint and in turn can affect change. And in my second kind of shameless plug of this short presentation, any projects that people might have that you'd like to deploy our students would like to work with me in partnership on this um, great expedition, please do feel free to get in touch. So this is where I would argue to bring it to a close that education for sustainable development empowers and equips our learners to affect change at all scales and in all learning spaces. So I've given you a whistle stop tour of just a couple of examples today. And this is really drawing on the premise, the core, the ethos of the SGG. DGs, leaving nobody behind, working together in partnership, drawing on data um, and really affecting change. And as I say, any, any thoughts or contributions would be really very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you there for that. If you're okay to just unshare your screen, um, I'll go through a couple of questions that have come in. Um, so on the um, teaching, how engaged you actually find the students in regard to the SDGs? Jen, did you want to answer that? Um, so I'll be honest, mixed. What I found in my experience is the students that are aware of the sustainable development goals are very engaged, they are very aware, they're very active. There was some research done by the National Union of Students, I'm going back three, maybe four years ago now, time, time flies, um, that identified that students who didn't know about the SDGs wanted to know, 
but fewer students knew about the SDGs than the research was expecting. Um, what I have found is that students are incredibly, forgive me, woke. Uh, they want to know about real world issues. They're very aware. We've seen um, the, the huge movements under Greta Thunberg, for example. I think students are much more aware, certainly than I was at that, that stage around um, kind of real world issues that speak to sustainable development, especially framed through, through climate crisis. I think there is a growing awareness of the SDGs. Um, one of the challenges for me is identifying areas that don't naturally speak to the SDGs, at least on the outside. So geographers, all my geographers are aware of their impact on the environment. Um, harder to make that language accessible, perhaps to dentists or engineers. Again, opening up new partnership potentials. Okay. I'll just come in there as well. I think there's another interesting aspect to young people and um, how they think about university and their choices. So traditionally, um, students, of course, would look at um, things like which city was that university in and what they wanted to study and do, do they, what, what's the nightlife like, etc. But what's really interesting, picking up on Jen's point about students being more woke now, um, you can see it in the data as well, that um, choosing a university, students are more likely to take into account that university's commitment to sustainability in its broadest sense when making choices about university. And I think that's a really interesting factor. So actually universities performing well and taking these issues seriously through their teaching and through their research, but also how they operate. Are, are those sorts of campuses sustainable campuses? That's going to have an increase in um, imp level of importance on students' choice of universities, we think. Oh, okay. And I've just, uh, we're running a little bit over, but I'll just do another couple of questions that have come through. Uh, somebody said they would be very grateful to learn about how blind, deafblind, partially sighted and disabled people have been incorporated into the SDGs at the university report. Uh, please, in respect for the need for safe and accessible urban environments, in particular around active transport solutions for walking and cycling. Yep. So um, just to say that obviously there's an SDG on in equalities, obviously reducing inequalities. And that's where most of the question, um, which we just had some of the indicators there, certainly within our university, we would frame them within that aspect. So yes, universities, um, as I said in my presentation, when you think about what our impacts are on something like this, um, like a physical disability in this instance, we do research on, on these areas, we teach about these areas. We reach out to the public, but of course we have our own operations as well, the way our own campus operates. So thinking about the accessibility of our buildings, thinking about online um, access now, which is really important for our students because we're teaching wholly online. So what, how does that impact on different groups of students? And we're seeing big impacts actually, um, as well as disability issues like social class as well. Um, some students having better access to um, good quality internet connections, for example. So that's a really good example of an issue which you can think about from a university and those four ways I outlined earlier. Yeah okay and one final question before we uh, go to Jo for her presentation. Um, so when discussing partnerships as an anchor institution does the university link with other an anchor institutions around Manchester to contribute to the SDGs? Uh um, Jen might have some views on this. I certainly do. Yes, you know, we we really pride ourselves on those partnerships. We we can't exist without them. So the very you think about those core that core business I talked about earlier of a university researching and teaching. Where do we get the research questions from? The best research questions. Um, in many instances, particularly in the sorts of disciplines in the humanities, which um, Jennifer and I would um, align ourselves to, they they often come from those partnerships. Um, in the first place, um, I think in terms of our teaching as well, we're increasingly seeing people who want to orientate, like Jane's doing, their teaching to real world issues, connecting them to community groups. So, for example, even a subject like history, you might think, well, how can you connect history to real world issues? Surely it's an abstract academic subject. Well, actually, there's lots of really interesting public history. So we've linked our history students to the development of a, a local park near where I live, which um, is trying to engage people by using its heritage, its amazing heritage, to make it more accessible to people and get more people to use it because it was a, a park that used to suffer from a lot of crime because not enough people used it. So using history in a really positive way to address a real world issue, that park is somewhere now that people go to enjoy nature for their well-being. Um, it has really important 
environmental benefits. And um, I think it's, it's really thinking through then how you can link, use the SDGs um, and use, use those partnerships. And as Jen mentioned in her presentation, that's a, as an explicit part of the SDGs, SDG 17. Jen, it'd be really good if you give your perspective because your program, I think, is a, a brilliant example of linking students' learning to partnerships outside the university. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, certainly the, as I outlined, the, the University Living Lab for Pedagogy is entirely about working with uh, organisations externally from the university as well as internally um, in, in partnership. So our external organisations... Mm -hmm giving us research they want our students to undertake. Um, oh, all right, that's not me. Um, and, and literally linking up those, those skill sets within, within different partnerships. We've part of this for a couple of years now. It's a great opportunity for our students to work with organizations at different scales. Some of them are quite small, emerging organizations through to kind of more, more recognized, established ones. Um, and it also means that the organizations get, if you like, some input from uh, very of the moment students um, who can find out new things for them. It's, it's an exciting new world.